Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin in the Atlantic region where a Mi'kmaq community is exercising their treaty right to harvest lobster under their own terms. Sabag and Agatee First Nation is relinquishing their commercial fish, fishing licenses to start off their treaty fishery without federal approval. Angel Moore brings us up to date. I'm here in Sabag and Agatee First Nation where Chief Mike Sack announced the new treaty fishery plan. It will be a five-month season and outside of the government-authorized commercial season. Sack said Canada does not have the authority to regulate. But for us, it's not about um, us fitting into the world that Canada or anybody else wants us to. As far as we're concerned, we're going to um, move forward with our own season as scheduled. The band intends to relinquish nine commercial lobster licenses to the Department of Fisheries and will instead redistribute the traps to the treaty fishery. The big argument was that um, everyone said there was, wasn't room in that fishery for any more traps. So, you know, we took it upon ourselves to make our own room. Conservation and research will be part of the fishery, led by Dalhousie professor Megan Bailey, who says that studies on seasonal fishing are biased because they only focus on commercial fishing. We tend to collect data in relation to the commercial fishery. We use fisheries dependent data to learn um, about the stocks that we, that we exploit. The treaty fishery is planned for the St. Mary's Bay area, officially known as LFA 34. Sabag and Agatee now calls Treaty Area 1, where the fishery was launched last fall from Sonyaville Wharf. That was met with violence from the non-Indigenous fishers who say the fishery is illegal. The police were criticized for standing by while the Mi'kmaq were attacked. SAC is calling on United Nations peacekeepers to step in. In my mind, our people are so mistreated. So if we say we're going to fish there in full force, there's going to be hundreds of DFO officers. Last year, you couldn't find one. So it's uh, systemic racism, and it's what Canada does, and we're hoping that um, United Nations will hold them accountable. In an email statement, the Department of Fisheries said they have not received a request from Sabag and Agatee First Nation to relinquish their fishing licenses. Fishing must occur within the established seasons, and Chief Sack is welcome to join discussions any time. Meanwhile, the community members of Sabag and Agatee will be meeting with, to discuss the meaning of a moderate livelihood. The treaty fishery is planned to launch this June at Sonyville Wharf. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Sabag and Agatee, First Nation. As the fishery season is expected to heat up in the Atlantic region, another Mi'kmaq community on the Quebec New Brunswick border has agreed on a five year deal with the Government of Canada. It upholds the Mi'kmaq Treaty's right to a moderate livelihood. Listagouche First Nation signed the Rights and Reconciliation Agreement a month ago, which recognizes Mi'kmaq laws and governance. And Listagouche can sue the feds if they breach the agreement, including infringing upon Aboriginal treaty rights. We spoke with Listagouche Chief Darcy Gray earlier this week. Chief Gray, thanks for being with us. Uh, has a moderate livelihood been determined for your community and what does it mean? Um, so at, at this time, uh, we haven't fully uh, determined what exactly moderate livelihood is. Uh, but we're certainly on our way to towards uh, working towards that definition or, or a better understanding of what that would look like for us as a community. How will your community govern the fishery according to Listagouche laws? So right now we have, um, you know, specific to the agreement that we just signed, uh, a lobster law uh, that's going to help inform how we go about uh, uh, implementing our right and, and managing our, our lobster fishery. In there, we develop an annual uh, lobster management plan. Uh, there's enforcement. There's in science and mon there's science and monitoring that that's included in the management plan. And so, um, through through those methods and those means, um, I, I think we can get closer and closer to finding ways to to implement uh, a moderate livelihood fishery or a treaty fishery that uh, that meets our values, our principles, and and gets closer to meeting community needs. How much influence will the Department of Fisheries and Oceans have on this governance and who will regulate the fishery? So for us, we've, we've been doing the management of the fishery for the last couple of years with regards to lobster. And if you, uh, not that salmon's in this agreement, but um, for sure we've been managing our salmon fishery for uh, almost 30 years here in the community as well. Uh, we, we take care of the planning, we take care of the enforcement. We have our own rangers that go out there and ensure that 
uh, the, the management plan is being, is being followed, that people are staying safe and doing things in a good way and, and, and following the, the regulations that we have in place. And uh, through the agreement, we've set up a, a collaborative uh, table where we can discuss uh, potential issues or problems and, and um, you know, collaborate on, on areas of management that, that are of mutual concern, ensuring that conservation is well respected and, and things like that. So, uh, so, so it's through, really through a collaborative con conversation going forward that we're going to get things done. So will your moderate livelihood fishery be in the commercial season following a you know, Minister's Jordan, Minister Jordan's announcement that new licenses will be within the com commercial fishery season? So the, the idea of seasonality is, is something that we're certainly going to be negotiating. Uh, what we've tried to look at is rather than say define commercial season and, and food fishery season, uh, just have a fishing season and, and you know that, that all of it contributes towards food, all of it contributes to, towards moderate livelihood rather than looking at, uh, at defining one or the other. A uh, deal still has to be finalized. Anything that uh, you see that can make the deal fall through at the last minute? Well, right now we have uh, we have uh, a signed agreement. We've we've committed to it, uh, but there's still a lot of work to go to go ahead, um, and in finalizing what's that going to look like uh, on the water and on the ground. So, um, so I, I think this is a huge step forward. It, it outlines certain commitments that that need to be. Uh, maintained and, and obligations that we have to respect uh, you know, by all parties involved and uh, I, I think uh, we, we won't see any change or, or anything uh, happening this spring but perhaps by the fall you might see some some things different some flexibility and, and certainly our, the negotiation table was set up to do that. Chief Gray we'll have to leave it there but uh, appreciate you taking some time for us. Thank you very much. To the north now, where officials in the Yukon are calling on the next government to invest in a safe consumption site it's to help the territory's opioid crisis. Since 2016, 40 people have died from opioids in the Yukon. Seven of those deaths are from this year alone. Well, there are supports in place in the territory like free naloxone kits and suboxone program and drug testing. The Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health says a safe consumption site is needed to curb the number of deaths. And I think Yukon, again, should strongly consider establishment of an overdose prevention site, or OPS, where harm reduction supplies and supports can be in place for people to safely use drugs that they have already obtained. And by bringing people to a safe place to use drugs, they're no longer using drugs alone or away from care. And repeatedly with these deaths, we've seen the majority using drugs alone. It's International Earth Day today, and Canada is outlining a new climate target. Details after the break. Welcome back. Today is International Earth Day, and it's been over 50 years since the launching of the global movement for the protection of the planet. Due to the pandemic, this year's event was hosted online by U.S. President Joe Biden, where Canada announced its new climate change strategy. But as Jamie Pashagumskum reports, some say it's not good enough. The goal is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees by 2050. This means limiting greenhouse gas emissions. In what he called bold steps, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau outlined Canada's strategy. Our new climate target for 2030 is to reduce our 2005 emission levels by 40 to 45 percent. And we will continually strengthen our plan and take even more actions on our journey to net zero by 2050. This is a step up from Canada's previous commitment of 30 percent. But it's not enough, according to the Green Party of Canada. They say Canada is way behind countries like the UK and Japan. The reality is that Canada is a top 10 emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. Canada is a top five emitter per capita of greenhouse gas emissions. Our greenhouse gas emissions increased last year, even in the midst of the pandemic, 
and we have barely succeeded in moving the needle in reducing greenhouse gas emissions at all. We have never succeeded in meeting our target. Paul stressed the need for green jobs, which are being lauded as the potential driving force for future economies. All of us, and particularly those of us who represent the world's largest economies, we have to step up. You know, those that do take action and make bold investments in their people and clean energy future will win the good jobs of tomorrow and make their economies more resilient and more competitive. Biden said climate change isn't just a threat, it's a race to overcome the existential crisis of our time. But at least the added bonus of the 1.5 degree target might just lead to massive green job creation. Jimmy Pashigumsk, APTN National News, Ottawa. To Yellowknife now, where a new mining project is making history as the first in the country to produce rare earth minerals. And local indigenous business operators will be the ones extracting the goods. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs took a tour of the mine and has this story. The Northwest Territories resource sector has a new kid in town. Nachalacho Mine, around 100 kilometers east of Yellowknife, entering production this spring, is the first Canadian producer of rare earth minerals. APTN was invited to a media tour of the mine. And this is some of our gear here. We have a three 40 ton rock trucks. We're using that to haul ore to the crusher. According to Cheetah Resources, operators of the project and owners of deposits near the surface, it's also the first time in Canada an Indigenous group is contracted for extracting minerals in its own territory. Something Kyle Bea is proud of. Uh, everywhere else I've ever worked, I've always been one of the, the mi minority, right? I've always been the either only one or the either only few. And around here, it's been pretty much 80%, I guess, 80% native, so it's good. Vea is a heavy equipment operator, originally from Delaney, Northwest Territories. Like, there's a lot of people back home that don't have tickets and don't have training, and they just don't, uh, they don't work, right? They don't have that. And I was lucky, lucky to get out and get my ticket. And Vice President of Operations David Conley says the demonstration phase of the project is small, with around 30 seasonal jobs this summer. We expect the physical footprint will be less than 10% of the average uh, NWT dial mine. While smaller in scale, the secret is in the sorting. No chemicals. It's actuated by air. Um, it has fiber optics, x-rays that's going to illuminate similar as a diamond. It's going to recognize that, uh, that product that we need and the product that we don't need. An expected 600,000 tons of ore-bearing rock will be extracted. 100,000 tons of that will contain the minerals used to power things like vehicles, wind turbines and cell phone cameras. That's the Baston site. Yep. Uh, the white, that's the quartz matrix. That's basically what we're mining, two, two minerals, quartz and bastosite. And because it's so coarse, it's going to be super easy to liberate. For Bea, who's worked in mines across the north, he's happy there's no tailing ponds. I was down in Fort Mac uh, last year, and like all the impacts down there I see, right? And there's not much animals, and grounds all drying up, turning into sand and stuff. And and uh, with the snow tailings, with this process we got here, I'm pretty happy uh, to be environmentally friendly, friendly right? And Product will be sold to Saskatchewan for processing, then shipped to Norway for fine separation of rare earth elements and sale. If all goes well, Cheetah hopes to hit the second phase by 2024 and expand into a larger open pit. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Natchalacho Mine, Thor Lake. A small city in Manitoba is honoring residential school survivors. We'll show you how after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Today's photo comes from Manitoba, Kuwait, and Aoki Mackinac staff member River Johnson taken in northern Manitoba. 
with the message for Earth Day to take care of ourselves. Two photos. Take care of others in your community and continue to take care of the land and the water. Great looking photos and a great message indeed. You can send us your photos by emailing your shot to share at aptn.ca and we'll do our best to get them on the air. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 10 with showers in St. John's, rain and 6 in Halifax. 3 below for Inukshuak, 3 above and snow in Kujuak. 13 for Montreal, 8 in Chibugamu. 13 for Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay with sunny skies. Showers and 14 in Thunder Bay, 12 with rain for Sioux Lookout. Minus 8 and snow in Churchill, 0 with snow for God's Lake and Thompson. Plus 4 with a chance of snow in Winnipeg, 4 and rain in Dauphin. Sunny and 4 in Regina, Swift Current and Esteban, 5 in Saskatoon. 3 in Meadow Lake, minus 7 with snow in Uranium City. In northern Alberta, minus 4 for Fort Chip with snow, plus 1 and flurries in Fort McMurray. 7 in Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, 6 for Edmonton. Showers and 14 for Vancouver and Victoria. 9 in Prince George, 11 and sunny for Smithers. 5 in Old Crow and Watson Lake, 6 in Whitehorse. Plus 3 in Trout Lake with snow, minus 8 in Yellowknife. Minus 15 for Saks Harbor, 13 below in Politak. Minus 11 for Chesterfield, Whale Cove and Baker Lake. Minus 10 with snow in Resolute, 13 below in Joe Haven. New large-scale mural honoring survivors of the residential school system is going up in a small city north of Winnipeg. The months-long project brought together elders, artists and students to complete the final piece. And those involved say the process is a representation of true collaboration between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. Brittany Hobson reports. This is just a portion of Mashkawi Gabawud Abanujiag, or Stand Strong Children. This new large-scale mural installation will be put on public display in the city of Selkirk. Standing at 12 feet tall and 160 feet long, the piece recognizes the legacy of the residential school system. Something this important, I think, deserves that big of a canvas. Jordan Stranger is the designer of the piece. He worked with elders to bring the final piece to life. Stranger says the size of the project allowed him to tell a full story, but it had to be simple. Starting from, you know, the beginnings of our Indigenous peoples of Canada and how wholesome we were and how connected we were to the land and then that transition into those dark times, um, you know, being stripped of your culture and being taken from your families and then eventually carries on into, you know, the mourning of the loss, the mourning of the loss of culture, and then thinking about, okay, what happens now? Ernie Daniels is a residential school survivor and one of the elders who contributed to the project. I think they captured the essence of the message for me, which is survival, resilience, and hope. The project was led by Jeannie Red Eagle, the emerging artist has lived in Selkirk for years. She says art can be a way to honour the history of Indigenous peoples, both bad and good. It's important to pay respect to that, to pay respect to that process. Um, and it's also important that we as Indigenous people understand the significance of our history so that we can go forward in a really good way and so that we can help heal together with each other, with our community, with our families, but also within our community, within our, our non-Indigenous community. The project brought together Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists, as well as local youth. Sierra Anderson spent the last two months lending her hand. Uh, for me, it's been all about, A, learning and getting to learn about those teachings and the things that, you know, I missed out on growing up, the things that have been forgotten in my family as well as the path to healing. 
through creating something so beautiful out of something so terrible. The piece will be put on display sometime this summer. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Selkirk. Great looking work. Former fashion mogul Peter Nygaard hit the headlines last year after being indicted in the U.S. for allegedly sex trafficking dozens of women. But little known is the story of his indigenous alleged victims. Here in Winnipeg, who say police are not adequately investigating their complaints in this country. Here's a preview of Homegrown by Holly Moore and Brittany Gio. Peter Nygaard, a made in Manitoba success story. But two Indigenous women in Winnipeg say he's a homegrown nightmare. Two women tell us it's concerning that Canadian police have not acted on their complaints with the same interest as American investigators. Especially after he was charged criminally in the U.S. last year. The women made complaints to Winnipeg Police Service in 2020. So they wonder, why the wait? Catch Homegrown tomorrow night right here after the news on APTN Investigates. Well, it's Thursday, so that means Nation to Nation will immediately follow this newscast. Here's host Todd Lamarand with the look at what's coming up. Here's what we're going to have on the show. Enbridge Line 3 runs from Alberta through Saskatchewan and Manitoba to Lake Superior in Wisconsin. Enbridge is currently replacing the line. The demonstrations against it have faded from the headlines in Canada lately, but that isn't the case south of the border. In fact, actress Jane Fonda joined a demonstration just a few months ago. A journalist from Indian Country Today will explain what's going on. As well, it was budget day for the federal government earlier this week. We speak to Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller about the $18 billion going to Indigenous people. That's coming up in a matter of minutes. I'll see you then. Thanks, Todd. Going to be a good episode as always. The whole show is coming up in just a few minutes' time. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day.